Okay, I'm just going to continue just the series that I've been doing on um, marriage, as you guys know. I've been spending a couple of weeks on it. So this is going to be the last week. I'm just going to give you one last marriage tip that I feel has really helped and strengthened my marriage. And this one is pro this one's probably the hardest, I'd say. Um, and so marriage tip number three uh, for this week is to um, confront and overcome conflicts and challenges. Confront and overcome conflicts and challenges. So not only um, overcome them, you know, so you'll have a conflict in your marriage, you'll have a conflict in your relationship, not only overcome them, but confront it. Because I think it's human nature for us to try and avoid it, isn't it? We try and avoid confrontation. We try and avoid um, uh, c confronting each other. But I don't think that's healthy for a marriage and I don't think that's healthy for any relationship. So point number one is, you know, don't avoid confrontation. Don't avoid confrontation because confrontation is inevitable, right? And when we're people... We're sinners. I remember last week we talked about having open and proactive communication. I mean, the more open and the more proactive you are with your communication, the more likely it's going to be that you're going to have conflict, right? So you need to deal with conflict and you need to deal with it in a biblical way and, and just confront it because generally the best way to deal with conflict is just confront it with humility and have it out in the open and talk about it so that you can deal with it. So don't avoid confrontation. Uh, problems are inevitable, aren't they? Um, so have strife and overcome it. Um, just, I just wanted to show you this verse. It, it, it's not really to do with, I guess, relationship, but you know, look at what Jesus says here. He says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus, even to his disciples, didn't say, Try and avoid all conflict. Try and avoid all tribulation. He says, no, 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 in the world you will have tribulation. So it's not about how do we avoid tribulation in the Christian life. It's about how to live the Christian life and deal with the tribulation, right? Having the right way to deal with it rather than avoiding it totally. So open and proactive communication will naturally lead to conflict. So it's very foolish to try and avoid it to begin with. So we need to learn to handle it rather than avoid it. And, you know, don't let things fester in your relationship because the longer you let it fester, the longer you let it breathe, the harder it's going to be to deal with. Every time I think of conflict in a relationship, I always think of dirty dishes. You know, I'm doing the dirty dishes and, you know, if you left dishes out for a really long time and then you go to clean them, it's a lot harder to clean the dishes, isn't it? So it's like with dirt in your life. It's like the longer you leave it and the longer it sort of festers and it bakes in and it ingrains, it, the harder it is it's going to be to clean it out. And that's why whenever there's a conflict, I mean, think about just, just in your, your natural life, right? You're just in, amongst friends or family. Whenever you have a conflict, what do you naturally do? You naturally want to put it off and just think, oh, time will let it uh, go away. But it, it doesn't. It, it just festers and, and bitterness rises. So you need to, in the spirit, when you have a conflict, to force yourself to confront it. You know, and I found in my marriage that the earlier I deal with it, as uncomfortable as it is and as hard as it hits the pride, the earlier you deal with it, the better it'll be. Because the, the more time goes on, um, the worse it's going to be for you. Uh, look at this verse here in Ephesians. Ephesians 4 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So you might think, well, how, how does this, I never thought of this passage as, uh, you know, as a relationship. We always think about where I'm heading to, which is um, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. But what does verse 25 have to do with the relationships? Well, you know, it's about being open and proactive communication, right? It's about being open and honest with each other. So we don't lie with one another. We don't say everything's fine when not everything's fine. We don't say nothing's bothering me when something is bothering you. You need to be honest with one another so you know what each other's thinking. So it says here, wherefore, put away lying. Don't lie to your spouse. Don't lie to your husband. Don't lie to your wife. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. So I just want to point this out, and you guys know that anger is not a sin. You know, it's not a sin to be angry, because the Bible says, be angry and sin not. So there is a time to be angry at certain things. There is a time to be angry at sin. And sometimes we see things in the world and we ought to be angry at it, right? We see what's, what's happening out there in the world. 
But it says, be angry and sin not, so don't do wrong. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So how do we apply this to a marriage? Well, if, you're going, if you've had a conflict that day, you have to deal with it that day. Deal with it as soon as possible. Don't, don't go to bed before dealing with that conflict and resolving it. And it's actually a sin if you do. Because the Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That means you don't let a conflict or your anger continue to the next day. Neither give place to the devil. Because if you do, that's where Satan is going to get a foothold within that relationship and he will wreak some havoc. And, you know, because the husband and wife are like the bedrock of that family, if the husband and wife have strife, it's going to naturally have a knock-on effect to the children, to the extended family, and things like that. So it's very important that as husband and wife, you keep things together and have peace there, um, because that's, gonna, that's the glue, really, that's holding the whole family together. Okay, so that's point number one. Don't avoid confrontation. Problems are inevitable. So if you have strife, you need to overcome it. All right, point number two. Now, much good can come from strife if it's handled correctly. I just want to show you a couple of verses about suffering uh, when I preached about this, that you know, suffering actually makes us better. Suffering and conflict actually grows us. Um, look at what it says here in Hebrews um, 2, 9 and 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. So he was made a little lower than the angels, for what? For the purpose of suffering, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation. Look at this perfect through sufferings. So Jesus Christ, part of the plan and part of the life of Jesus Christ was to go through this suffering, the suffering of his death. Remember Paul said, you know, that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering, he says, um, being conformable unto his death. And here it says here that, he, that the captain of their salvation was made perfect through sufferings. So what I want to just do for you this morning is just, just, just to remind you, give you a different spin on conflict. Give, give you a different perspective on conflict. Because remember, we naturally try to avoid conflict because we think it's bad. And conflict is bad. You know, conflict is, is, is part of a sinful world, you know, and having strife and, and division and things like that. But in the world that we live in now, we, can, we know that a lot of good can come from it. We can grow from it. Uh, we can see here that Jesus was made perfect through suffering. So if you know that and you have that perspective in your relationship, you don't, you don't necessarily have to welcome conflict, but you know when you have conflict, it's a chance to grow. It's a chance for you and your wife to be stronger. So even though we want to avoid conflict, we know it's going to be inevitable, right? So it's better to change our perspective on it and look at it as though, well, I've had a conflict now and instead of, oh man, again, another conflict, another fight, another argument, you can think of it as, hey, this is another chance for me and my wife to grow closer. This is another chance for me to learn something. Because think about it, the reason why you're having this conflict is because there, there's something that you're not understanding about your wife. There's something you're not understanding about your partner or your husband. So this is a chance now to learn something new, tweak something in your life, do something different and improve your marriage, improve your relationship. Look what it says here in Job 23.10. Job says here, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So not only conflict in a relationship, but just in your everyday life, in your Christian life. You know, sometimes when we go through tribulation, we go through hard times, we're like, oh, again. And we, and we have the perspective, oh, I wish it would just go away, as opposed to the perspective of, hey, you know, this is good for me. God is allowing this to happen. What can I learn from it? You know, this, this is what, remember when Kevin preached about worry and he says, hey, it's like a feeling that we have to, it's a response to change something, right? Because we're worried about it so that we change something, we do something proactive about it to fix the situation. That's what I want you guys to think about conflict. That it's not, oh, I don't want it to happen again. It's, hey, this is another chance to change something. What is this conflict teaching me where I can change something in my life, I can make myself better and I can do something to improve this relationship and, um, 
build this relationship, make it better. Uh, James 5, 11. This is another one just to do with Job because we, you know, Job was tried and, and look at what James comments on Job in, in James 5. Behold, we count them happy which endure. We count them happy which endure. I mean, it's a, I think that's a, that's a hard verse to internalize because, you know, when you're going through suffering and tribulation, you know, th this is a very hard verse to live by. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. <clears throat> Romans 12, 17. So much good can come from strife if it's handled correctly. Look at uh, Romans 12. It says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So sometimes it isn't possible, right? Sometimes if you're standing up for God, you're standing up for what's right, um, there isn't peace there, but as much as possible. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. So again, see, it's not wrong to be angry, but there is a right place to put your anger, isn't it? It says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. So don't get revenge, but rather instead give place unto wrath. So where do we place our wrath? It says here, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You see, so vengeance and revenge is God's place. It's not our place to have to go and seek revenge. And that's why when we get angry, when we realize we have been wrong, the right response is to, to give it to God and God will right the wrongs. We don't have to worry about getting justice ourselves when it comes to just personal relationships. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And this is a really important one for relations. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Because our natural response is what? When somebody does wrong to us, we want to do wrong back, right? We want to get back at them. We want to get even. But that's not the right thing to do. And in fact, that's just going to make your relationship worse. You know, so if you go and you try and justify yourself, and you try and seek revenge and try and get back at them, you're not helping the relationship. You're not, number one, you're not obeying God. You're not glorifying God. And number two, you're just going to make your relationship spiral downward. So if you really want to have a successful marriage, you want to have a successful relationship, you need to put these principles into practice. So when you see conflict, handle it correctly. You've got to continue to love them. So conflict is good if it's handled correctly. It can strengthen, you know, it can, it can even strengthen a church. You know, that's why, you know, even when there's conflict in church, we have to have the right perspective. If there's conflict, we don't think, oh, you know, again, it's happening again. There's another problem. No, it's, it's what can I learn from this? Why did this conflict happen and what can we do different? How can we grow from this? How can we love one another more through this conflict? So it can strengthen a church. It can strengthen a relationship. It can strengthen a friendship and it can also strengthen a marriage. Because you can learn a lot from conflict. You remember when I told you guys last week that, uh, you know, me, me and my wife, you know, we never really fought that much, you know, at the beginning of our marriage because what was there to fight about? You know, especially when you both come from a Christian background, you both agree on certain things, there was nothing to fight about. But eventually it does happen. You know, you, you get on each other's nerves or you do something or, you know, you say something that you shouldn't have. Um, or, you, or you, in my case, it's sort of like you start taking each other for granted. Do you know what I mean? You start taking for granted what your wife does for you. You start taking for granted what your husband does for you. And you no longer appreciate the work that they put in to make that relationship work. And then, you know, when you start taking each other for granted, you're not as appreciative anymore. You start talking to each other not as nicely anymore. And that starts to sort of, you know, fester and build up. And then eventually you'll have a conflict. You'll have an argument. And you know, to me, you know, I used to think that way as well, where it'd be like, ah, oh, you know, I mean, Elizabeth's not here right now, but it's like, ah, oh, Elizabeth, she's, she's giving me the silent treatment again or whatever. But, you know, that's why I'm, what, the reason why I'm telling you to have the right perspective, I'm not saying I was always like, this is something that I have learned in my marriage, where, you know, you, if you have that perspective, you're not thinking how to rectify the situation. Because I started to realize hey, the reason why my wife is not happy at this moment, the reason why we're having this conflict is because 
I think she's something that she isn't. You know, because I'm acting in a way and thinking, oh yeah, she's fine with that and everything like that. But then it starts to come out and I thank God for it because now I've learned, hey, this is something that actually bugs her. But I didn't know. Do you see what I mean by conflict can actually teach you things? And if you have that perspective, instead of focusing on, oh, why is this, like, you know, I don't want this conflict to happen, you'll focus on, hey, is why this conflict is happening and what I can learn from it what, and what I can do better. So you can learn a lot from conflict, like something you didn't know about your spouse and something you took for granted. All right, so don't avoid confrontation. You know, much good can come from strife if it's handled correctly. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13, the uh, charity verse. I just wanted to read this verse to you and just make a point. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, we know it talks about charity. But look at verse 6 and 7. It says, It rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, if you, if you look at verse 7, it doesn't look like a very comfortable verse, does it? Yeah. It's bearing things. It's enduring things. It's, it's like trying to put trust in things and, and thinking the best of other people. And the point I just want to make is, you know, true love, like true love that God wants us to have, it's love that's proved in the bad times. You know, true love is proved in the bad times, not in the good times. So when, you, when everything's going smooth, when everything's going great, and you're like, oh, I love my husband, I love my wife, Every, everything's going great. Well, it's because th that's, not, that's not the extent of love that we should have because it's easy to love somebody when they love you. But true love... The real love that God wants us to have is the love that's in the bad times. You know, for better, for worse, for sickness and in health, right? For richer, for poorer. So true love is proved in the bad times. So beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. So the question is, you know, how, how can you have true charity in your relationship if you're not bearing anything? If you're not enduring anything? You're not, you're not believing in anything. I mean, if you're not bearing anything, then... You don't have charity because charity says it bears all things. If you're not enduring anything, then you can't experience charity. So part of the reason why God allows us to go through these conflicts is to teach us charity so that we would grow in charity because it's, it's an opportunity to express charity. Because if you never bear anything, you never endure anything, then you're never going to um, put this passage into practice. Uh, let's go to Luke uh, 6. Uh, is that the passage I wanted to go to? Mm, ah, yes, it is. All right, we'll read from verse 26. It says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So this is the context. It says, But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. So, um, you know, that's, that's not something that we would do naturally, is it? But this is true love, right? Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them which curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. So just tr try and apply this to a marriage, you know, when, when sometimes you feel like your wife or your husband hates you, or they're despitefully using you. What's the command of God? To, to, to love them, to do good to them, to bless them that curse you, pray for them. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have you? And this is the point I was trying to get at. You know, true love is in the bad, not in the good. Because look at what Jesus says here. If ye love them which love you, what thank have you? What are you doing so great when somebody loves you and you love them back? That's not, the, that's not the level of love that God wants us to strive for. It's saying here, if you love them which love you, love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. So you're no different to just an unbeliever. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. 
But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. See, so when you do something for your spouse, you need to do it unconditionally. You know, don't, don't have strings attached and then when, you know, when she doesn't do something or whatever, you, you bring up passing, but I did all these things for you. Well, you didn't really love her in the sense that God wants you to love her if, you, if you're saying you, you're trying to use that as bargaining power for the next time, you know. It says here, um, And lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. So love is proved in the bad times, um, not in the good. True love, the love that God wants us to have. All right, so point number four is, so I've got, so I've had, you know, don't avoid confrontation. You know, much good can come from strife if it's handled correctly. Love is proved in the bad times and the sort of love we should have is described here in Luke 6. And I just wanted to point out this verse here and make a point here. It says here, um, it says here, And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. So I sort of touched on this on Romans 12, and it talked about, you know, vengeance belongs to God, you know, give place unto Ra. And the point I just want to make here is, you know, you, you, you're not your spouse, you have the ability to keep the peace in your relationship, you know, because generally we always put it to the other party. Remember I talked about that last week, where it's always the other person that has to change. You're always the other person that has to do right. If they would just do the right thing, then everything would be fine. But we have to change that mentality because we can't change other people, right? We can only change ourselves. And also we shouldn't be focused on other people serving us, right? Because I could, I could be the same, right? I could be like, oh, if only you guys would be better church members, this church would be better or something like that, right? But, you know, that's silly because I, should, I shouldn't be looking at, you know, wh why this church is the way it is and looking at you guys and putting the onus on you. I need to be firstly inward focused and say, hey, I've got to improve myself, improve my knowledge. I need to be a better soul winner. I need to be a better husband. I need to be a better father. And then hopefully then when I've taken the beam out of my own eye, right, then I can help try and encourage you guys to take the, the speck that is in your eye. So in a marriage, you need to have that perspective. And, and think, you know, you have the ability to keep the peace in your family. Don't put the onus on your spouse and say, hey, if only they would do something different, we would have peace. Because in every situation, you can always um, have peace in your home. And it's just like, this is why I wanted to point you to this first. Because look, if somebody smites you on the cheek, you can smite them back, right? But the person that's having themselves smitten on the cheek they have the power to keep the peace because what's the response? Turn to him the other also. Not fight back. You know, do good to them that hate you. You know, that you can do right. And if you, as long as one party in the relationship is doing right, there will be peace. There's only conflict when both parties are doing wrong. So you have the ability to keep peace in your home. Turn, you can turn the other cheek. Serve. Don't expect your spouse to change because it's out of your control. It may just... It may just frustrate and disappoint you. I want to show you this verse in Genesis, uh, Genesis 13, 7. I believe this is an example of turning the other cheek. Uh, look here, it says here, And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So remember when Abraham was called out of the, uh, of the land of the Chaldees, right? Lot went with him. Now Lot wasn't meant to go with him, right? That's what a lot of people think. So Lot was not meant to go with him. Lot went with him. And now they've grown to the point where there's strife between their herdmen and their cattle. Now, should Ab I mean, Abraham was the older. Abraham was the uncle, right? So you could say, well, Abraham didn't have to give, give way to Lot. 
you know, Abraham was older. I mean, Lot should have respected Abraham and Lot should have went to the left if Abraham went to the right. You know, Lot didn't even, shouldn't have even come out with Abraham. But if Abraham had that mentality, the strife would have just continued, right? So Abraham, you know, hopefully being the more spiritual one in this, in this situation here, I mean, it's just a story and we did that we're just gleaning from. But we see here that he was willing to turn the other tree. He had the power to keep the peace. So when there was strife, what did he say to Lot? Hey, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. He gave way to Lot pref Lot's preferences, right? And to Lot's desires. He said, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. So there's an example of if one person does the right th thing, you can have peace. One party has the ability to make it work. Now, the reason why I bring this up, <laughs> the reason why I bring this up is because you need to realize that conflict in a relationship only occurs when both parties do wrong. When, when both, you know, because sometimes we want to put blame on the other party and say, oh, it was their fault, or you say it was their fault. But when there's conflict in a relationship, it's always because both are doing wrong, right? Because if one person did the right thing, there wouldn't be a conflict. Right? Because there would, be, there would be humility, there'd be forbearance, they'd be doing good to the other person and keeping the peace. So it's only when both are doing wrong is when you have conflict. <clears throat> so just think about that when you're blaming your spouse and saying, you know, oh, if you do this, we wouldn't have this conflict. Because you also wouldn't have the conflict if you were doing right too. Right? So generally you have a conflict when neither party is willing to humble themselves or compromise their desires or change their behavior. And I just wanted to bring up just an extreme example because uh, you know, it's one thing that really bugs me is, is domestic violence. Because domestic violence is just an extreme example of you know, a, a conflict in a relationship, right? But the reason why domestic violence really bugs me is because whenever it's in the media and whenever you hear about domestic violence, it, it's always the woman that's like the victim. You know, it's like, oh, the, these, these women that are victims. And of course, you know, if they've, if they've been beaten up, of course they're a victim. But generally what the media doesn't go on about and doesn't talk about is the part that the woman had to play in that domestic violence. Right? Because there's always two sides to the story. And obviously a woman with a black eye, you look at her and you feel sorry for her. And, and of course we do. I'm not saying that it, it is a justified thing at all. But... My point is that there's always two sides of the story and I think domestic violence is one of those things where it always swings in one extreme and not the other. And when, and when you sort of even allude to say, well, what was the wife like? What was her relationship like with the husband? Did she nag him all the time? Did she bug him all the time? Did she do all this? Then you're like, oh, are you saying that it's the woman's fault? And this is, what I'm, this is the point I'm trying to make is that, that when there's conflict in a relationship, it's both their fault. And it's almost like the world doesn't let you have that position. Because if you say, oh, you know, the, the woman did something wrong, oh, you're saying it's the woman's fault. Or you say, oh, the man did something wrong, it's the man's fault. But you can't have the position that they both did wrong. You know, because maybe it was the man's fault, obviously, for, for, for beating his wife. But then you wonder, but did the wife provoke him? Was it like just years and years of, of, of a bad relationship? Years and years of nagging? Remember the continual dropping, the grievous words? And then to the point where he's just backed into a corner and then he starts striking blows? So, you know, you don't hear this side of the story in the media where, you know, what was their relationship like? Yeah, okay, he, he came home and he did something wrong, but what were the events leading up to that? What about the years before leading up to it? These are the things you don't hear. And, you know, my position is, both parties are wrong when it comes to domestic violence. I think it's very, very rare. I won't say always, but I'd say it's very rare where you know, a lady is just doing everything right, but she's still getting beaten. You know? But um, one thing is, you know, when it comes to domestic violence, I just want to make this point a bit funny. It should always, it should always be about the man beating the woman. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, if, if it's domestic violence and the woman is beating up the man, I mean, come on, guys, you'd, have, you'd just have to man up, all right? <laughs> like, it, it's pretty embarrassing if it's domestic violence the other way. And it, it's almost like this equal rights movement is trying to swing it the other way. You know, there's these, so, did you guys see on YouTube these social experiments? where, you know, a, gu a guy is like telling his girlfriend off and pushing her against the wall and everyone would jump in and try to help the girl and go, hey, man, what's your problem? Like, leave her alone. 
And then they'll do it the other way around where, you know, they're walking down the street and then the woman's like slapping him and everything like that and everyone's just laughing at him. Well, that's because when, when that happens, he's not a man. And, and it's just ingrained in us that if a woman is beating up her husband, everyone's just thinking, well, you've got to man up and stand up to your wife. Like her slaps probably don't even hurt. You know, so I just think it's funny that they're trying to make this point and say, oh, men get domestically abused as well. And it's like, well, if you were a real man, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get domestically abused. You'd just be able to fend off your wife. So, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, if a man is being domestically abused, he needs to man. And, but I thought, you know, okay, I'm sure there are exceptions because maybe, maybe you're married to like some woman MMA fighter or something like that. And if that's the case, then, you know, maybe you have an excuse to be domestically abused. She can choke hold you. Um, so I think it's just a biological fact, right, that men are stronger than women and they're more likely to use physical force rather than words when, when there's strife. So it should always be about men being um, men abusing the women when it comes to domestic violence. Um, <clears throat> but you know, the point I want to just make here is, because domestic violence is an extreme example, and it's always swung to, oh, the woman's always the victim, She's, she never plays any part in domestic violence. But I, I honestly believe, and you know, I don't know that many domestic violence cases, so maybe if you guys do, you can correct me later on. I just personally believe that in 90, probably 99% of domestic violence cases, they could have been avoidable. Just using that principle that I was talking to you about, that if you, you have the power to keep the peace, and even a woman, I think, that is being abused by her husband, I just find it hard to believe that even if the husband is under, under the influence of drugs, under the influence of alcohol, if a wife was quiet, submissive, obedient, you know, and, and caring for her husband, did what's right. I mean, you think a husband, you think a husband is just going to beat up a, a wife that's just loving him and just, you know, submissive and obedient. I mean, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. Maybe, maybe you guys know of an example, so let me know. But, but in my mind, it just does not make sense. Something needs to have been built up. Something must have been said, in my opinion, for that to have happened. So don't misunderstand me. You know, I am not saying at all that it's the woman's fault. Oh, I, actually, I am. I'm not saying it's only the woman's fault. Because remember, I believe that when there's conflict, it's both of their fault. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if a, if a woman gets domestically abused, that it's all her fault. Because obviously the man is wrong. And that is the greatest sin. Because he's meant to be the protector of his family. So he should be the more sober-minded one, the protector, and shouldn't be obviously abusing his wife. But it's always the result of two people, I believe. And you know, I've read, I, I, you know, you read articles online and you read blog posts about divorced women who are even in abusive relationships. And, and I just think it's ironic that because they're in this abusive relationship and then they start a blog and then they start blogging about how terrible their husband was. And you know, I just needed to correct him on this and correct him on that. And you just think, is maybe that the reason why? Your relationship went sour because you felt like you always needed to give your opinion and you always needed to say the. And now that you're not married, now you're telling the world about it. You know, what, what, of course you're going to have some conflict there. So there's nothing wrong with speaking your mind or giving your opinion as a lady, of course. But you know, can you can you expect to have a successful and peaceful marriage if you're a contentious and continual dropping to your husband? You know, and if there's one thing we know about broken marriages, and this is why even when there's any conflict in every, any marriage and one person is made out to be the victim of the other, you know, if there's one thing you know about people that are in broken marriages, and we all know somebody that's in a broken marriage, right? And when they tell you the story, what do you, what do you, what do you know? The, the story that they're telling you, they're always the victim, right? Because like I said, it's just natural for sinners to blame other people. You know, it's like Adam, you know, he blamed his wife and then Eve blamed the serpent. It's natural for us to blame other people when we have conflict. And that's why when you hear a story you know, of a conflict in a marriage, whether it's domestic violence or anything, you're always going to hear the person is a victim. You know, they're the victim. And that's why I just think it uh, comes across that way. <clears throat> so a lady might ask, you know, why should I be submissive to this man? Well, it's because it's God's commandment. And your role as a wife. So, you know, when it comes to the issue of domestic violence, you know, even if he is sometimes a bit unreasonable, you know, if you obey God's commandments, you'll have peace in your family. And there's a reason why it's like that. Is he doing the right thing? No. So nobody's justifying what the man has done. What, what, domestic violence is evil, right? It's sinful. 
doesn't justify it. But I, my point that I'm just trying to make is that the woman in the domestic violence situation has the power to avoid it, in my opinion. <clears throat> So how, do, so, so how would you resolve conflict in, in a relationship? Well, let's go to Matthew 18, 15. Because, you know, when you resolve a conflict in a relationship, in a marriage, it's no different to any other relationship. It's no different to any other conflict. You know, so there aren't special rules for marriage. There aren't special rules, you know, just because you're married to somebody. It's just more important that you put them in place, remember, because you spend a lot more time together and you spend every waking moment with each other, there's just more opportunity for conflict to happen, and that's why even more so it needs to be applied in that relationship. Matthew 18 says in verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So that's the first step, is that you talk to them about it alone. Now, this is very important in a relationship in marriage because... I mean, number one, you know, it, it, you, d you don't want to be aggressive, you know, when you confront them alone. You know, so don't be aggressive. Remember we talked about the soft words, the soft answer, um, you know, being quick to hear, slow to wrath. So don't be aggressive. But the, the point I just want to emphasize here is that you go to your husband or your wife alone. So your first point of call when you have a conflict is not your sister, not your best mate not your colleagues at work, not your mom, not your dad, not everybody else, not Facebook, right? Like don't have a conflict and then post a status update and say, oh, my husband, I can't believe he did this. No, your first point of call is meant to be you and him alone, right? Because that's the most important relationship. Once you start going out of that first, you're just further degrading that relationship because now when you have a problem, you're not going to each other. You're going to somebody else. So don't talk about your marital problems to all your friends. Uh, and first and foremost, obviously, you know, you've dealt with it. You know, because I tell you about my marriage problems, right? But it's because I've dealt with them with my wife already. And it's things that I'm, I'm, I'm okay sharing with you. Um, so go to them alone. Don't talk about your marital problems to all your friends. Definitely don't put them on social media. Um, you know, and have some, you know, and, and you've got to think about, have some respect for your spouse. You know, like you wouldn't want, you know, I'm sure like, you know, ladies and guys, you have a best friend. You know, I'm sure your best friend doesn't appreciate you sharing all your secrets with everybody else. And it's the same thing with your marriage. You know, you have issues in it. You know, have some respect for your spouse. You know, you want other people to think well of your spouse. You know, it's like with, it's like with God, right? You know, with the way we talk about God and the way we, it's because we want people to think well of God. You know, we want people to, we want people to uplift him. And it's the same with your spouse. You know, you want people to think well of them. So, when you talk about your spouse to other people, you want it to be generally positive because you, don't want, you want to respect and honor them as, as your partner. So have some respect for your spouse. Deal with it privately. And, and you know, number two, keep the bedroom private as well. You know, the Bible says that the, the, the marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Sometimes people will ask, well, what, what are you allowed to do in a marriage in terms of phys physical intimacy? Well, we can say what the Bible says, right? The marriage bed is undefiled. So in, in my opinion, it's, it's the green light on, on, on anything. Anything that a husband and wife wants to do, they can. It's none of my business. It's none of your business. And, you know, that's why don't, I don't think we should really talk about it in detail with other people. Because I, I remember seeing a, a lady on Facebook. She posted like, you know, oh, my wife, my husband wants me to do this. Is that okay? Well, I think it's wrong, first of all, to even ask the question because it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret. And, you know, when it, comes, when it comes to giving advice, this is why when I preached on physical intimacy, you don't see me going into all the different methods and techniques and everything like that because it's inappropriate. And we don't need to because the Bible says the marriage is honourable and all and the bed undefiled. That's all we need to know. We just need to know that between a husband and wife, they can do whatever they want. Their bodies belong to each other and it's up to them what they want to do. So definitely do not put conflict on Facebook and definitely do not talk about your bedroom life on Facebook either on social media because that's between you and, your, and you and your husband. Have some respect because you may think, oh, you know, well, I'm just asking my, my friends what they think. But will your spouse honest, think the same thing? You know, they may not want their other people to know what you guys get up to. So keep it to yourself. Uh, please, please 
uh, oh, I, I put here, people ask about what is allowed in the bedroom and I just put, you know, the bed is undefiled. So that's the first step. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So, so if you can, that's where I talked before, that if you can resolve that conflict, it's going to build that relationship. It's going to make it stronger, isn't it? You're going to gain your brother and you're going to be even closer. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So if you need to escalate, then you talk about it with a couple of people. So they need to be present. It's not go talk about it with a couple of people with them not present, right? Because it, it, it needs to be fixed with this person. And it's the whole idea there is so that people can't say, oh, they said this and they said this and there's all this hearsay. So the whole idea is, is there's a group of people now, either maybe, I guess with the two people, so either three, four or five people to talk in the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word may be established. And if she, he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. So then you then take it public, right? You approach the church and the, the person then is publicly shamed in church, right? To say, hey, they're doing this and they need to stop. Um, and then it says here, Tell it unto the church, but if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So those are the points of escalation and no other. So we need to make sure that we handle conflict correctly. So we confront them alone, number one. Then we confront them with one or two witnesses. Then number three, they, they are publicly confronted in a church setting or in a larger group. And then number four, they are actually kicked out of the group. And treat it as an unbeliever until they repent and they get right, right? And they, and, they, and they are sorry for it and they attempt to do what is right. Now the reason why I'm just bringing us to this, because obviously we can use this for any conflict, but I just wanted to apply it back to the domestic abuse example. Because some people have that question of, you know, how do you, how do you deal with domestic abuse? If you're trying to do what's right, you can't resolve it. What are the steps you would take? So this is my opinion on, on it, right? So with the domestic abuse example, Number one is, you know, when it says go between him and thee alone, that means I, don't, I personally do not believe you go to the police straight away. I don't know if that gets me into trouble. In, does this get me in trouble in Australia? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, do not go to the police straight away. You have a method on how you are to deal with conflict, right? And this is how you should deal with it. It does not mean we don't go to the authorities at all, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They don't go to the authorities at all, at all, even though there's report after report after report of, of ch child abuse and sexual abuse, right? They don't even go to the police at all to, to, to put these guys in jail at least. But so you don't, don't go straight to the police. Why don't you go straight to the police? Because man's laws are unjust, right? And they're not always the right thing to do. I mean, man's laws can conflict with God's laws, right? Especially in Australia, you go to the police and then you take out an AVO, Right, and now you, can't, now you can't even talk to each other. Now the husband can't even try and approach the wife to make amends because he's breaking the law. So if you go to the police first, you're actually going to make that relationship even worse. And, and you know, the, the law is not always on our side. They're not, they're not trying to amend a relationship. They're just trying to keep people safe. Right? They're not trying to fix a relationship. God is interested in fixing a relationship. That's why he has this method of resolving conflict. So man's laws can conflict with God's laws. You've got AVOs, um, you know, false accusations. That it, you, know, you know, the government sometimes is more destructive than it is restorative to a relationship. Because you know, what happens if they, they arrest the husband and put him in jail for a couple of weeks? How is that helping the relationship? You know, be apart for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and not only that, man's laws can be biased. Man's laws can be biased, especially in Australia, towards the female, right? So we, 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 we don't go straight to the police. We need to, you need to deal with it between one and another. But let's say, for example, a woman is being abused. Let's, let's say the rare example, she's doing everything right, she's still being abused. She's, she's tried to approach him about it in a, in, a, in a soft way. He's still doing it. Then, you know, she tells either family or people in church, every, everyone confronts him, you know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And he says, oh, you know, I'm not going to do it anymore, whatever. Um, but he continues to do it. There's no, there's no change in behavior at all. 
Right, so now what do we have to do? We have to escalate it again, don't we? So now it's brought to the attention of the church. It's, it's, he's publicly shamed and everybody knows this is what he's doing unless he repents. Now let's say he doesn't repent and he's still doing it, right? She's still, she's still you know, under threat of harm. Now what? Well, now that we've gone through those three levels of escalation, what does the Bible now say? It says here, if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Because remember, a lot of people will say don't go to the law first because in 1 Corinthians 6 it says you don't sue another brother, right? So that's one reason why we don't go to the unjust court system or the unjust laws or, or call the police with un who are enforcing unjust laws sometimes to, to deal with conflict. But when it's gone through the necessary escalations, now the Bible says let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So isn't that interesting? Because you can sue an unbeliever, can't you? You can take an unbeliever to court. You can take an unbeliever to the police. So that's why I think there's this escalation level here where it's alone, two or three witnesses before the church because the idea is that through those escalation points, number one, it's trying to restore that relationship. And then number two, you know, in an ideal world, the church should be enforcing God's laws and trying to support that relationship and, and, and judging righteously. And if he still will not hear that, then we go to the authorities. And then, you know, we pre you, know you press charge or you do whatever um, is required to the courses. And it's the same with any conflict. It'd be like if somebody owed you money, right? Like if somebody owed you a lot of money or they, they borrowed money and didn't pay you back, you could go through this escalation, couldn't you? Because people say, well, you know, how, how can I get my money back if I can't sue him? Well, you should ask for it back first. If he doesn't give it back, then you go in the mouth of two or three witnesses and he still is not willing to try and pay it. Then it's brought before the church and if he's still not willing to pay it back, then you can sue him because now you're treating him as an unbeliever and you can sue an unbeliever. So that's how I, in my mind, make sense of, of that escalation of dealing with conflict. So you should, you should only not sue a brother or sister in Christ once you have gone through these three steps. So if you haven't gone through these three steps, then you aren't able to go before the law, before the unjust to get judgment. I don't think it's, it's a good idea. So what should be the punishment for a man who physically abuses his wife? I, and this is my last point. What, what should be the punishment for a man who physically abuses his wife? Because you might say, well, the man should be fined. $10,000, $20,000. This is what I mean by unjust law, because I don't know what the punishment is in. Ashton, do you know what the punishment is for a man that... Uh, it can be a fine, but it can be like a jail sentence. So, so it can be, so okay, so now I've got these two here. So it can be a fine or it can be a jail sentence. See, this is why you don't go first to the law, because that's their two options, right? Their two options is they either fine the family or they throw the husband in jail. Now remember when I said to you that a, like laws often are destructive. They're not restorative. Because number one, if you fine the family $20,000, how does that help the family? You know what I mean? Like, okay, the husband just abused the wife. Now you're going to take $20,000 away from the wife? Because, I mean, that money is probably supporting her as well, right? And then what's the other option? You throw the guy in jail. So now, now the children don't even have a father. Now the, the, the woman doesn't even have a, a husband to take care of her. You know, so how is that restorative? How does that even help the situation? It just makes it worse and it just destroys that relationship. So what should be the punishment? Well, I think according to the Bible, he should probably get a beating. You know, because it's, not, it's not, probably not a crime worthy of death. You know, you're not gonna, he's not stealing anything, so he's got nobody to, to pay back money to. And the only op other option in the Bible is that he's beaten. And I guess the physical beating that you'd get from the government is a lot worse than, you know, just a spank on, on the bottom. So I would say when, when, a, when a man is beating his, beating his wife and, you know, she's done everything she could to keep the peace, she's gone through these escalation points and now it's gone to the law, a righteous government would then take that man and beat him. Whatever they feel is just in that, in that the judge would decide, right? And that's what the punishment should be. All right, so anyways, I, I, I don't know if that went a bit off track, but I hope that was interesting to you. So just remember the last tip was to confront and overcome conflicts and challenges. So hopefully that gave you a few practical tips and a few stories to help you remember that. All right, let's pray.